Hey everybody, it's Zach. Welcome to my channel where I talk about gay stuff, author stuff, trans stuff, and just random special interests that I have. This video is about the phalloplasty options available to adults seeking bottom surgery. In this educational presentation, I will discuss an overview of the main surgical procedures that are used to accomplish successful phalloplasty for transmasculine and non-binary individuals. I provide illustrations of some parts of the procedures, as well as somewhat detailed medical descriptions to discuss surgical and anatomical details, which some viewers may find unsettling. So use care when consuming this content. Timestamps are included for those who wish to skip the surgical details, and chapters are listed in the description. Sources and references are listed on the slides. This video includes all of the phalloplasty procedures, which each have their own video on my channel and are linked in the playlist at the end of this video. Before we begin, uh, here's just a little housekeeping. First, it's important to remember that this is not medical advice. I am making this video with the sole purpose of giving you a jumping off point for your own research. Second, be kind to each other in the comments. Everyone's transition looks different, and what works best for you might not be what's best for someone else. Finally, YouTube's algorithm works off a few metrics. Watch time, whether or not you're subscribed, and whether or not you click on to another video from my channel. The best free way for you to support my content creation is to watch the videos all the way to the end, click the like button, and subscribe to my channel. All right, let's get to it. Today we're going to be talking about phalloplasty options, and I want to go ahead and say up front that the majority of my research and sources were pulled from fallow.net, which is, I think, an incredibly useful source if you are looking to do a deep dive into the different types of surgeries that are available to you. Then we're just gonna be doing an overview and then based on the type of interest I get from you guys, uh, I will then decide what I'm going to make next in relation to the phalloplasty options and the details and stuff like that. And just keeping in mind that this is an educational video, I'm not a medical professional. I am not offering you medical advice. I just, I want to provide you a jumping off point for your own personal research to decide what option is best for you. I want to emphasize that I'm only talking about fallow in the FTM context here. Sometimes phalloplasty has been used to correct ambiguous genitalia. It has also been used uh, to help reconstruct phallus structures for natal males who have maybe sustained an injury due to explosives or what have you to allow them to then regain the use of that appendage. But today we're going to only be talking about it in the FTM, FTM context. So today's just an overview. We're gonna go over what is fallow, why would somebody get fallow, what is the history of fallow, then we're going to kind of go kind of one by one into the different types of phalloplasty that are currently available and being used. It will give you an overview and then provide you with some other sources that are not just fallow.net where you can read up and learn about what is the procedure, what is it generally used for, and you know, just lead you into your own research. So without further ado, let's get to the what. So what is phalloplasty? Phalloplasty is a gender affirming surgery that creates a phallus using tissue taken from a donor site such as the forearm, leg, back, abdomen, hip, or groin. And FTM phalloplasty may also include vaginectomy, urethroplasty, scrotoplasty, glansplasty, and implant surgery. And some of the factors that you might consider when deciding what the best option is for you is do you want erogenous sensation? Do you want to be able to do penetration? Do you want to be able to stand to urinate? Why phalloplasty? This gender-affirming surgery happens when a consenting adult exhibits symptoms of gender dysphoria that can be alleviated by surgical measures, 
Some doctors and insurance providers do not require gender dysphoria in order to approve surgical intervention. Some surgeons may require transmasculine individuals who are on testosterone to stop their medication for the weeks surrounding the procedure to aid in healing. This surgery and its surrounding procedures are only conducted if the risks do not outweigh the benefits. And that is something to be decided between you, your endocrinologist, your primary care physician or general practitioner, and your surgeon. What is the history of phalloplasty? In 1936, we have the first recorded total phallus reconstruction using what's called a tabularized pedicled abdominal flap surgical procedure. And in the 1980s, microvascular free flaps transfer was introduced, which means that we started doing microsurgery to aid in the healing blood supply and sensation of that area. Free flap phalloplasty is now the more common approach. So the first type of phalloplasty that I want to approach here is called Kim FTM phalloplasty. It is named after the surgeon who developed the method. So this is also called a conjoined bilateral pedicled groin flap phalloplasty. It's a three-stage procedure and it's less expensive than other microsurgeries. Um, you can, if you choose, uh, receive an implantation of a malleable erectile prosthesis, but you cannot receive an inflatable prosthesis. Your results are going to look like four inches long on average by about 1.75 inches in girth. You will be able to avoid while standing as long as you choose to get your erythroplasty. And you may also be able to do penetration, especially if you choose an implant. Now, uh, erogenous sensation is achieved through a buried clitoris at the neophallus base. However, some surgeons may allow you to opt to leave your clitoris unburied. Um, and then you will expect tactile sensation in the bottom half. The stages of the surgery are, you know, they'll vary between surgeons, as will pretty much the stages of every surgery that we talk about. But generally, stage one will be your phalloplasty, scrotoplasty, and your tes testicular implants. Stage two will be your penile prosthesis implantation if you choose that. And then stage three will be your vaginectomy and urethroplasty if you choose those. Now, there has been a recent bigenital surgery increase, if you will, where a lot of people are choosing to not do that stage three with the vaginectomy and urethroplasty. As I mentioned, this is actually one of the least expensive phalloplasty options. Generally, including all of the stages, averages out to be about 23,000 US dollars, which is really acceptable <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. If you're only opting to do stage one and two, that's gonna knock down your price by almost seven grand. So if you're looking for something that is affordable and flexible in terms of your options with vaginectomy and urethroplasty, this might actually be your best bet. The surgeons offering this phalloplasty are, are few and far between. You've got Dr. Kim, who's in Seoul, Korea, and then you've got Dr. Ivan Arinquez, who is in Mexico. The Kim method is a groin flap phalloplasty variation in which a large pedicled flap the size of approximately 15 by 30 centimeters based on the superficial circumflex iliac artery is raised from the left inguinal area. The flap's medial aspect is not dissected and is left in situ. Commonly, the dissection can be stopped when the vessels have been reached. The flap is rolled up and sutured into a tube. The lateral end is split in the middle into a fishtail, which is de-epithelialized. At the lower aspect of the os pubis, or the position of the neophallus base, an omega-shaped skin incision is made. Both de-epithelialized tail parts are anchored deep into the omega incision to sturdy tissues on either sides of the midline and the flap skin is sutured into the pubic skin. 
Thus, the flap is anchored at both ends with a resulting bucket handle appearance. The bucket handle is left for approximately five weeks to ascertain circulation into the tissue from both ends of the flap. At a later procedure in local anesthesia, the initial medial pedicle is transected and the neophallus is expected to be circulated from its base. Once completely healed, a number of outpatient surgical procedures are offered, such as the insertion of erectile rods and in, and in some cases testicular prostheses, coronaplasty, and tattooing of the glands. All right, so the next option I want to talk about is abdominal phalloplasty. This is also known as suprapubic phalloplasty. It has a shorter operative and recovery time than most other surgeries, especially because microsurgery is not required, um, and you can have a buried or preserved clitoris. So uh, one of the huge positives to this surgery is that you will avoid the forearm scar, the dreaded scar that a lot of transmasculine people are not really interested in having. Um, additionally, you should be able to do penetration, and there's generally no nerve connection required unless you choose to do urethroplasty, in which case there's a nerve connection that's used to help indicate to your body when to void and when to not. <laughs> um, and it's only got two stages. Stage one is your phalloplasty, which is done via abdominal pedicle. Stage two is your glansplasty, and that may take place during stage one, depending on your surgeon, but in most cases it can be done as early as one week after your phalloplasty surgery. Um, and then the costs range pretty widely, anywhere between 30 and 50,000 USD. And that's going to be the average cost for pretty much any other surgery that we talk about in this video. And there are a plethora of surgeons offering abdominal fallow. Um, a lot of them are in Texas and Pennsylvania, interestingly enough. For those of you who are looking into this particular surgery option, I highly recommend checking out these studies as well as just hitting up Google Scholar and typing in the surgical procedure you're interested in learning more about. Look for results, look for what the procedure entails, look for pros and cons, and look for newer stuff. And, you know, as much as the academic community kind of is dismayed by older studies, it, they're still worth looking at. Obviously, you're going to come across some terminology that isn't as culturally sensitive as modern times. So you might come across the word transsexual. You might come across the word uh, biological female, so on and so forth. Take it with a grain of salt. Look at the statistics, and obviously, as with any study, research who wrote it, who participated, because that will give you a lot of value in terms of how much salt you should be taking with that study. The next option is bird wing abdominal phalloplasty. It's kind of a subset of the abdominal phalloplasty that we just talked about. It gets its name from the way in which the abdomen is cut to create the neophallus. Interestingly enough, the way that it's cut does minimize visible scarring. It makes it a lot easier to hide when there is scarring. Um, it also provides potential for implants and urethroplasty, and there's an easier post-op recovery, again, due to the shape in which the pedicles are cut. The results are an unremarkable linear scar on the abdomen, space for an implant, you're going to look at three to five inches in length. There is some tactile sensation. Surgery costs are pretty much the same as the others. And your surgeons that offer bird wing fallow are likely going to be anybody who offers abdominal fallow. They should be familiar with this procedure. If they're not, and that's something you're looking to do, talk to them and see if they'd be interested in reducing your cost in order to gain the experience by using you effectively as a guinea pig patient, but some surgeons will agree to that. In bird wing abdominal phalloplasty, the technique is that under general anesthesia, a patient is placed in the lithotomy position. Urethral lumen is catheterized easily by inserting a Foley's catheter. 
a bird wing incision is marked with its base in suprapubic mons pubic location and lateral extensions up to lower abdominal skin crease, extending both flanks. The base to limb ratio of the flaps is kept at 4 or 5 to 1, so that adequate blood supply is ensured to the most distal end. It may be noted that a unique feature of this flap design is the common base, which sustains the blood supply to both flaps. And the depth of the incision reaches up to the anterior rectus sheath at the external oblique, aponeurosis, from medial to lateral. Thus, the blood supply of this region is provided by superficial epigastric and circumflex iliac vessels. Abdominal flap, apposition, and phalloplasty, both lateral wings are approximated in the midline using subcuticular structures. Traditional abdominal phalloplasty, contrary to the bird wing procedure, uses a somewhat rectangular shape instead to form the neophallus while remaining pedicled and still attached to the suprapubic or pubic mons region. So next we're going to be looking at ALT phalloplasty. This is your anterolateral thigh phalloplasty. This one's incredibly common because, again, it avoids that dreaded forearm scar. And this can actually be conducted in a few different ways. You've got the free flap or the pedicled flap, pedicled meaning it's still attached to its donor site. And then you can also get it with or without the combined forearm procedure, which we'll go into in a moment. Microsurgery is not required if you're going to do the pedicled flap, and it is compatible with urethroplasty and implants. Your results uh, should allow you to stand to void, reasonable ability to penetrate, you should be able to receive sensation. Um, and then there are severe complications possible. Of all of the information that I read about this, the complications for this particular one seem to be more likely than in others, but they're rare. And then your surgery stages over the course of two to three years will be your pre-op, which is your electrolysis, your hair removal, then you've got stage one, which is your vaginectomy, phalloplasty, and scrotoplasty. Again, talk with your surgeon if you don't want to do vaginectomy or scrotoplasty. Those are things that you might be able to even like reduce the price of the surgery because you don't want to do them. Um, stage two, urethroplasty, which might be done in stage one or two or both in two different stages. And then your glansplasty, which again can be done as early as one week after stage one. Then your stage three, which is your testicular implants, which might also be done in stage two. Again, talk to your surgeon, because if you don't want to get the scrotoplasty and you don't want to get the testicular implants, then that might be a more favorable option for you. There are a ridiculous amount of surgeons that offer ALT fallow. Like, it's one of the most common options. For those of you who are looking into this particular surgery option, I highly recommend checking out these studies as well as just hitting up Google Scholar and typing in the surgical procedure you're interested in learning more about. Look for results, look for what the procedure entails, look for pros and cons, and look for newer stuff. And, you know, as much as the academic community kind of is dismayed by older studies, it, they're still worth looking at. Obviously, you're going to come across some terminology that isn't as culturally sensitive as modern times. So you might come across the word transsexual. You might come across the word uh, biological female, so on and so forth. Take it with a grain of salt. Look at the statistics, and obviously, as with any study, research who wrote it, who participated, because that will give you a lot of value in terms of how much salt you should be taking with that study. So our next topic is RFF phalloplasty. This is radial forearm fa flap phalloplasty. Say that 10 times fast. I know I tried and failed. Um, it is actually the most common. It is compatible with both urethroplasty and prosthesis. 
the results are that you will have visible scarring on your forearm and potentially some loss of sensation, some difficulty in using your hand. You should be able to penetrate provided you use prosthesis. You should be able to stand a void provided you choose to do urethroplasty. And you should be able to receive erogenous sensation via a buried clitoris at the base of the shaft. Your surgery stages for this typically follow the ATL surgery stages and the costs are comparable. And there are a significant number of surgeons who offer this uh, pretty much equivalent to the number of surgeons who offer ATL. If you're looking to do some research on what this is, what it looks like, pros and cons, these are some of the studies that I recommend reading. Um, again, it's really important to kind of ignore the title in these. If you feel the words don't apply to you, that's fine. Focus on the anatomy, focus on what it is that you want to achieve, what risks you're willing to accept, and focus on listening to the reports from people who have gone through these surgeries. The RFF and ALT procedure is relatively the same, including the construction of a urethra via the tube within a tube method. Both have the option for urethral lengthening as well as uh, prosthesis. However, of note, RFF has a lower risk of complication with urinary development, whereas ALT has a higher rate of urinary and other complications than RFF. Stage one of the planned delayed ALT flap phalloplasty is performed in the following way. Preoperative hysterectomy in which the uterus is removed and the vagina is left intact is completed before the surgery. Thigh hair removal is also completed in advance to limit hair growth inside of the neuro neurourethra after phalloplasty. A 22 centimeter wide by 16 centimeter long ALT flap is marked starting five centimeters cephalad to the upper ridge of the patella centered over the line created by the lateral patellar edge and the anterior superior iliac spine per classical description of the ALT pedicle. Doppler ultrasound is used to locate and mark the location of expected perforators preoperatively, usually while the patient is awake. No other radiology techniques are used to locate perforators. During surgery, all edges except the proximal edge of the planned ALT flap are incised, and the blood supply of the flap is isolated, save for a few perforators. The proximal edge is left unincised to limit subsequent edema of the flap after delay. After this point, the flap is closed and two suction drains are placed and are later removed when their daily output falls below 20 cubic centimeters per day. Simultaneous vaginectomy is completed during stage one by a second operating team when desired. After a healing period of six months, stage two of planned delayed pedicle to ALT phalloplasty is performed using a standard tube within a tube method for urethral creation. A benefit of delaying the ALT flap is that partial flap necrosis, usually of the flap edge, can occur relatively harmlessly, as necrotic tissues can then be excluded from the subsequently created phallus. The next one I want to talk about is MLD phalloplasty, and it has actually two different options. We're going to go over the broad strokes one first, and then the more specific aspects of the newer option that's been developed. So MLD phalloplasty is a surgery that uses tissue from the back muscle to create a good-sized phallus that enables standing to void as well as erectile function with a phallus implant. The musculotaneus latissimus dorsi, MLD, flap comes from a part of the back muscle that includes the thoracodorsal vessels and nerve. The blood supply is connected to the femoral artery and the saphenous vein or the deep inferior epigastric artery and vein. The thoracodorsal nerve is connected to the ileoing guinal nerve, that's a freaking word, um, and because that thoracodorsal nerve is a motor nerve and not a sensory nerve, sensation in the phallus is not expected with this procedure. That's important to note. No nerve connection is done to the dorsal clitoral nerve, even so some patients do report tactile sensation in the phallus. So what are the top three things to consider here? It is compatible with urethroplasty and scrotoplasty. 
in terms of size, you can expect five to six inches in length, 3.9 to 4.7 in girth. And you do have erogenous preservation because the clitoris is left untouched. And many phases um, are involved here, and it can actually require debulking procedures. If you look back up at girth, I think that kind of speaks for itself there. So a rendition on the MLD phalloplasty is the reinnervated latissimus dorsi free flap phalloplasty. And reinnervated is the key term here. It is prosthesis free and provides penetrative ability. So let's get into it. In a 2008 study led by Dr. Rano at Masuric University, the reinnervated latissimus dorsi free flap phalloplasty was used in phalloplasty surgeries to allow voluntary rigidity of the neophallus. From the first 22 patients, 18 obtained motoric function of the reconstructed phallus, and researchers concluded that this voluntary contraction of the phallus is a consequence of the reinnervation of the transferred muscle, and the contraction is strong enough to stiffen the phallus. In this procedure, the thoracodorsal nerve is structured to the anterior branch of the orbiturator nerve, which runs to the gracilis muscle. All of that to say, yes, it's possible to achieve um, voluntary rigidity of the neophallus using this method. I don't know what the longevity looks like because of how new this is. Um, and then there's some studies that you can look into in terms of learning kind of what this is, how does it work. Number one is going to be the original study. Number two is talking about the technique. And number three is an evaluation of the results in terms of contraction power and voluntary rigidity. There are several surgeons that offer MLD, not nearly as many though as would offer ATL or RFF. MLD is a really specialty type procedure because it involves using a muscle from your back. Um, so these are currently the only surgeons who offer it there are some in the United States, obviously, some in uh, the Czech Republic. The MLD phalloplasty process is a little bit more involved than the other processes. And this is because it uses tissue from a muscle in the back called the latissimus dorsi, and it is used to allow for erectile function for the neophallus. Now this surgery is performed in several stages. Preoperatively, the non-dominant arm site region is massaged regularly to improve local skin elasticity in order to allow primary closure. The first surgery consists of removal of the internal natal genitalia the creation of a neophallus using the latissimus dorsi free flap with microvascular anastomosis and clitoral lengthening and the incorporation into the neophallus, urethral reconstruction using vaginal and labia minora flaps, and the insertion of testicular implants of appropriate size into the neoscrotum, which is created from the labia majora. The internal natal genitalia can be removed by transvaginal or laparoscopic approach. Reconstruction of the neourethra begins with the reconstruction of its fixed part. A vaginal flap is harvested from the anterior vaginal wall with its base close to the female urethra meatus. The flap is joined with the remaining part of the divided urethral plate, forming the fixed part of the neourethra in cases with a well-developed and wide urethral plate. Further urethral reconstruction includes using all available vascularized hairless tissue to lengthen the neourethra to its maximum extent, preventing post-operative complications such as fistula. The inner surface of both the labia minora and the clitoral skin are dissected to create a flap with appropriate dimensions without detachment from the outer labial surface. This allows for excellent vascularization of the flap. Flaps are joined to create a tube and lengthen the urethra from its vulvar part. The urethra is lengthened further using available clitoral skin. A Y incision is made in the infrapubic area above the clitoris 
for later fixation of the neophallus. After that, an inguinal incision is made to identify dissect and mobilize the femoral artery, saphenous vein, and illoloinguinal nerve. The patient is then placed in the lateral decipitus position using beanbags, with the upper torso placed in a full lateral position at 90 degrees and the pelvis tilted at 30 degrees to provide access to the groin, allowing simultaneous flap harvesting and recipient site preparation. Flap planning begins with marking the anterior and superior muscle border. The flap dimensions are planned to match the normal size uh, in adults, which is 11 to 15 centimeters wide and 11 to 18 centimeters long. The glands is designed over the distal 5 centimeters of the flap. A 1 centimeter wide skin strip between the future glands and the shaft is designed to imitate the coronal sulcus. Flap elevation starts with an incision to the anterior skin margin down to the deep fascia, and the plane is developed between the MLD and the serratus anterior muscle using sharp and blunt dissection. The flap is divided inferiorly and medially, cauterizing the large posterior perforators of the intercostal vessels, and then lifted to expose the neurovascular pedicle. Only a small strip of muscle around the blood vessels is isolated to decrease flat bulkiness and allow its safe tubularization. All major branches are identified and carefully litigated. Smaller vessels are cauterized. The neophallus is created while the flap is still profusing on its vascular pedicle by tubularizing the flap. The fully constructed neophallus is detached from the skin oxilla after clamping and dividing the subscapular artery and vein to achieve maximal pedicle length. The donor site defect is commonly closed by a direct approximation if direct approximation is not possible due to local anatomy. Grafting with a split thickness skin graft, STSG, is recommended. The neophallus is transferred to the recipient area and microsurgical anastomoses are created between the thoracodorsal and femoral artery and between the thoracodorsal and saphenous vein. Flap viability is assessed by clinical examination, i.e. skin color, local temperature, and capillary refill. After that, the clitoris is incorporated into the neophallus, subsequently using blunt and sharp dissection. A subcutaneous tunnel is created through the neophallus to insert the neourethra in, into the new urethral opening, which is commonly placed in the proximal part of the neophallus. All patients have a suprapubic urine derivation catheter placed for a period of three weeks following a urinary Foley catheter for two weeks. Postoperative assessment of neophallic availability is performed by clinical examination, and vascular patency is monitored by a pocket Doppler device. A special dressing is used to keep the graft in an elevated position, preventing pedicle kinking. The second stage, six to nine months after this one, includes further urethroplasty and insertion of penile prostheses. All right, so we're on to our last phalloplasty procedure, and that is going to be fibula free flap phalloplasty, FFF. <laughs> and this one is really fascinating. This one has some potential issues with longevity of the results, but let's kind of get into what this is first. The benefits of this surgery is that you're gonna have no forearm scar, you're going to have natural rigidity without an implant due to the use of your fibula bone, you're going to have a barrier to preserved clitoris, and you may be compatible um, with urethroplasty depending on your surgeon, and your end results. You can expect tactile sensation. You can expect the ability to penetrate. You can expect a length of 1.5 to 6 inches. However, there are risks. The two like really big risks here, number one, the fibula bone that is used to create rigidity in the neophallus may actually end up being reabsorbed by your body. That's one thing. And number two your risks related to your donor area recovery and post-operative use of your leg, your ankle, in terms of walking, running, balance, stability. There's a lot of risk there. They take a significant chunk of your fibula, which means that of the two bones that hang out in the bottom half of your leg, one of them is mostly gone. 
you've got two surgery stages here. You've got your phalloplasty as stage one, and stage two is your debulking and glansplasty. And the surgeons who offer fibula free flap are going to be few and far between. <laughs> there is one in Texas, and the rest are going to be outside of the United States. Strongly encourage whoever wants to undergo this procedure to read up on as much literature as possible. On the screen are a few of the studies that I think are worth reading. Some of them are recent, more of them are older. As you can see, this is not an incredibly popular procedure. However, I can understand the appeal. So the fibula free flap phalloplasty is again similar in process to any phalloplasty that is using a flap donor site method. However, it does have some differences. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is sensation. Tactile sensation in the top and some area of the bottom of the phallus is provided by re the flap with the lateral sural cutaneous nerve. The LCSN, as it is also called, may be connected to one of the two dorsal clitoral nerves. While some patients have claimed to have erogenous sensation in the phallus, this is not the expected result, and for this reason, the contralateral clitoral dorsal nerve and the clitoris should be left untouched in those who wish to preserve erogenous sensation. This particular surgery also uses the osteocutaneous fibula flap, um, in which the harvested fibula bone is transplanted and fixed to the cubic symphysis, providing rigidity. The condition of this flap was found to be favorable after up to one year of follow-up. However, there are risks of bone absorption, curving and fracture, and the rigid appearance of the phallus can be difficult to conceal, which may be a source of embarrassment to some. The first use of the fibula flap for phalloplasty existed, uh, was documented in 1992. The flap can be harvested in a single stage or pre-laminated to create a neo-urethra. The pre-lamination of the neo-urethra tends to reduce the incidence of urethral fistulas and better controlled girth because the flap is wrapped around the urethra rather than tubed. For pre-lamination of the, of the neo-urethra, a full thickness skin graft wrapped around the catheter is inserted into the leg. At the second stage, the fibula osteocutaneous flap is harvested based on the peroneal vessels along the posterior interosseous septum, leaving 7 centimeters of fibula bone proximally and distally. The skin paddle can be oriented horizontally and then tubed or vertically and then folded on itself. For the vertical skin pattern, the distal skin paddle contains the fibula and the prelaminated urethra and is then folded in the form of the ventral side of the penis. The proximal skin paddle is more sensate and forms the dorsal side of the penis. The sensation of the flap is provided by the LSCN, which courses posterior to the septum in 74% of cases, with an anterior branch in 26% of cases. Hage et al. recommended preoperative sensory marking by injecting lidocaine over the biceps femoris tendon and marking the resulting numb area on the lateral and marking the resulting numb area on the lateral aspect of the lower leg. The bone is then fixed to the penile corpora cavernosa or the pubic symphysis. Page et al. suggests making the bone around 2 centimeters longer than the skin paddle so that the phallus is not floppy. The fibula provides rigidity and in many cases obviates the need for a penile prosthesis, which can be fraught with complication. However, the bone is subject to reabsorption, warping, and fracture over time, and some find it difficult to conceal in pants. De Bernig et al. have described a perineal fasciocutaneous flap over the leg that does not include the fibula. This technique addresses the criticism that the permanent rigidity of the osteocutaneous fibula flap can be difficult to conceal. The primary advantage of the fibula site is the ease of concealing the donor site. In early experience with the flap, the rate of urethral fistulas was very high. Prelamination of the urethra, however, has reduced the incidence, but it does add an additional step in the reconstructive process. Thank you so much, guys, for joining me on this journey to explore phalloplasty options. If you liked this series, let me know in the comments. I want to do more. <laughs> I want to do more. I'm thinking of covering meta next or top surgery. And um, this really is in my wheelhouse. I love learning about medical stuff and I love talking about it and sharing it with people. So 
If you liked this, let me know. If you hated it, also let me know. Just leave a comment on what it is you do want me to cover next. Thank you again. I hope this was educational, and I will see you next time.